Hi everybody, uh, I'm Thierry Fautier from Harmonic and I'm uh, happy to uh, moderate this panel. So last year we had a great discussion here about uh, the potential of VR. I'm happy to share with you today uh, what has been deployed at PCCW and this panel is about uh, this uh, Hong Kong uh, 7 uh, event that took place in May this year. And uh, I want uh, first to run a few slides about what was the event. So to start with uh, PCCW, this is an operator based in Hong Kong, which has uh, been operating since 1976. And this event was the Hong Kong 7, which is Hong Kong 7, which is kind of a big tournament in the Asia Pacific uh, area where you have uh, multiple teams coming to uh, play rugby. So the background of this was uh, PCW Now TV had the rights for this Hong Kong 7 and they already experimented some long haul transmission uh, together with Harmonic. And we had actually six weeks to deliver a complete turnkey project. So this was kind of a challenge for the entire ecosystem. So I think uh, in terms of process, we provided some consulting initially to uh, PCCW and then uh, because we had already some level of integration with uh, Nokia, it was making a lot of sense to bring the company together. And Nokia, of course, is provide, providing an end-to-end -end solution besides encoding packaging. An ideal system was actually the system integrator also reselling Nokia and Harmonic in Hong Kong. So at the end of the day, we had uh, the first live 3D VR service. It's not a demo, it's not a trial, it was a service in Asia. Uh, this was deployed in less than six weeks, so if you hear people telling you it's complicated, please uh, come to see us. And the platform used were HMDs, web browser, YouTube, and Facebook, which means try to reach the maximum number of users. So I think PCW was happy about the result, and I think uh, Margareta will share with us the excitement. And this was also a good press coverage in terms of uh, buzz created at the event. So what was the event about? If you look here, you... Okay, it's very weak. So you have three cameras which were on the stadium. And those were uh, three OZO uh, 360 2D camera. And uh, 3D, sorry. 3D camera, and if you look at the architecture, it was basically three camera with the uh, live uh, server to do all the stitching, then a live production using 4K technology. Harmonic was doing the compression, and this was pushed to the PCCW Global CDN, and this was addressing all the H Hong Kong uh, VR viewers, and we'll look later on on the platform. So. Important, the host broadcaster was Now TV, and the VR integrator was the ideal system based in Hong Kong. If we talk about numbers, we had resolution 3840-2160P30, uh, with the one profile being streamed to HTC Live, Oculus Rift, Samsung Gear VR. A second set of profile was 9020-1080P30 for all the YouTube, Now TV, web platform, Google Cardboard. And then there was a lower resolution AVC, this time with HLS for the, other, for the same device. So this was kind of adaptive streaming between six and four megabits per second. In terms of uh, content and technology, uh, sorry, in terms of coverage, we had CNT in Asia, uh, front cover for the edition, you can see at uh, Broadcast Asia. A lot of uh, media buzz uh, with Nokia technology mentioned, newspaper coverage, and of course, uh, we had some support from Oculus in order to launch uh, this event on time. So now I would like to share with you two videos. Um, the first one will be a promotional video produced by PCCW, and the second one will be a screen capture of what you were able to experience on the HMD. So I'm going to start with the first. PCW Global is expanding its media delivery capabilities and part of that we see VR as a big future in media delivery. Our specialty is in the network delivery and connectivity and we believe that bandwidth is going to be a huge part of delivering live VR. So PCW Global has uh, partnered up with Ideal Systems to deliver this source-to-screen VR project 
Ideal Systems has provided all the VR production skills and expertise, while PSW Global has contributed on the connectivity and media delivery. Together, that brings a source to screen solution for the Hong Kong Sevens. cameras that we're using are Nokia Ozo. This is part of Ideal Systems Ideal Live, uh, the real VR virtual uh, reality experience for viewers as well as uh, 360 surround sound as well. So this is quite an immersive experience. Uh, it's a first in the world for rugby live coverage. Uh, it's first in Asia for any sort of uh, major international sports event to be done in 360 and you can have a virtual seat on the touchline here in Hong Kong Stadium. Our Nokia Ozo camera. So we have eight lenses on here that you can see. And I'd like to point out, not there's not just lenses. There's also small microphones placed around the camera. So there's also eight microphones. So not only do we capture 360 degree 3D image, but we also capture three dimensional sound. We have been very excited to bring this world's first VR project. Uh, we chose the Cathay Pacific HSBC Hong Kong Sevens because our parent company HKT is very strong in the Hong Kong market. It's been great working with Ideal and bringing this new technology and the new capabilities to the PCW Global Media uh, portfolio. So now you should be able to see... So this was actually a screen capture on a PC of what you see with your HMD. Don't look at the resolution, this is a low resolution tran uh, transfer, but this was of course uh, Ultra HD resolution sent to the HMD. So let's start, uh, can we go back to the main, uh, main uh, slide? Let me introduce you uh, the panelists. So we have, uh, let's say, start by the woman, Margareta Sauger from PCCW. Uh, who is uh, going to represent uh, PCCW, and then Devon Copley from uh, Nokia Ozo, who is part of the product team. And I'm going to start, of course, by the woman. So, Margareta, how did the project start, and what was the motivation to have this type of event in VR? Absolutely, thank you. And thank you so much for having us be part of this. The brainchild behind it is actually Alex, who you just saw in the video. With PCCW Global being the international arm, uh, we're very keen in continuing to grow our value-added services, and most growth have been, has been within the broadcast and media environment. So Alex is a talent that will look at, you know, we do networks, we have experience with live events, VR is such a big high buzzword, why not do this? Why not be the first in the market? Well, hypothetically the first in the market, doing a live 360 VR. So that really was the motivation to kind of look then at how do we make this happen? How do we create a use case? So we were quite excited to kind of look into this and quickly had to engage Harmonic uh, because there are so few use cases to fall back on and to learn from. So we're really being innovative in learning this and, and getting the handle of what does it take? So the second question is, why the Hong Kong Rugby Sevens? What's special for this event? Well, it's, it's a, almost an optimal alignment of all elements. PCCW Global has, again, the ability and the talent. HKT is our parent company. They're the incumbent in Hong Kong. They already deliver fiber to the home, so from a viewer perspective, that was important. Now TV, another sister company of ours, has the content rights to the Rugby Sevens. So you combine those elements and then also look at the event itself being very fast-paced, very dynamic, 14-minute gameplays. So that plays in well with a VR type of um, experience where you could really be present in the event. So hence, that was the option to go with. It was an ultimate event in combination of the city where it was taking place. So tell us about this 
project, the, the integration, and I know ideal system mm -hmm. was helping you for that end-to-end -end integration in less than six weeks. So tell <laughs> us how <laughs> this is possible because looks a lot of new technologies. It, it sure was. Um, and, and really, we couldn't have done it um, had we not partnered up with Harmonic right from the beginning. You know, we're good at network and delivery. We've done live events, but we're not a production house. We simply couldn't. We don't have that expertise. So really, together with Harmonic, we compiled an RFP to go to market and sourcing who can really handle all the stadium aspects of this event. Um, that led us to Ideal Systems, so that led us um, to the, um, Ozo product, the Ozo cameras, very excited about that. And uh, from there, we were able to script out, you know, how we're going to go. Are we going to go unicast, multicast? Are we going to go multi-bit rate stream? So all these elements were then lined up to start within that six-week per period. So now you got these partners, Nokia, Harmonic, PCCW. Um, you first have to convince Now TV that this was going to be a viable use case, a viable, true live event that wouldn't do any brain, um, any brand damage to them. So also, of course, with the HKRU, there was also great concern on the field itself. You don't want to be in the way of the players, of the traditional media broadcasters, etc. So we had to work with those environments as well to compile that. Okay. Devon, mm -hmm. I know this was one of your first live commercial service and not a trial. So yeah. tell us what was Nokia's contribution to the project? Well, we provided um, a pretty complete suite of technologies uh, from basically glass to glass. So uh, many of you are probably aware of the Ozu camera, which was the first uh, professional integrated camera for VR. And for, you know, bulk of 2015 into early 2016, um, or sorry, bulk of 2016 into early 2017, the only integrated camera that you could buy. Um, so by the time this study came around, you know, we had already had some experience in the field with capture, um, but the newer technologies were the delivery and consumption technologies. So the Ozo Player SDK, which is a multi-platform uh, library for uh, 360 rendering, um, and the, um, the Ozo Live uh, production uh, workflow. Now. Uh, both of those components were really designed to be able to be used um, you know, in the field by third parties. I think our intent all along, well, all of the components, has been to enable production services providers like Ideal Systems to provide these kind of services to customers like PCCW. But this was, uh, I th if not the first, it was one of the first examples where that really happened. And what we found so, uh, I think, encouraging and exciting about it was that really we had very little to do at Nokia with the actual production itself. We made, I mean, we got a support phone call from, uh, from Ideal Systems saying, hey, we're going to do a multi-camera live shoot in Hong Kong in, you know, in I think it was five weeks at that point. Um, and we're like, uh, okay, okay. Uh, what do you need? And they're like, just letting you know, <laughs> you know, make sure that you're here if we need you. Yeah. But um, the only thing they really called on us to do was to lean on Oculus to speed the app through the approval process. Um, other than that, um, they were able to do most of this themselves. And the reason for that was because largely we were designing, a, we were designing for existing technologies. We were trying to enable you know, folks who are familiar with app development, familiar with broadcast um, production, to use existing tools to produce this new medium. And that's indeed what they were able to do. You saw from the photos um, or from the, the video, you know, they're using standard broadcast video equipment to do the switching between the cameras to carry the signals from the field. Um, you know, the, the Ozo camera uses SDI output, so it was able to take advantage of existing infrastructure and, of course, be able to use uh, some of the harmonic infrastructure that was yeah. already in place mm. for the delivery. Mm -hmm. um, now, I think that is not the end point for VR uh, delivery, for, especially for live, by any means. But as a starting point, as a way to leverage these existing technologies you know, that are in the field and the expertise that people have, it allowed us uh, you know, all together to put this production on with very little lead time. Yeah, mm -hmm. I can only comment on the glitches. 
uh, one of the issue was how to distribute the audio across the production system, yes. knowing that audio comes from one camera, has to go to broadcast, has to go to other ways, so we had to find tricks, but this is a dirty laundry. So well, no, 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 let me speak to that, actually, because that, that had been a pretty significant challenge for um, VR production, because you want to have 360 mm -hmm. audio as yeah. well, and at this time, we were not able to deliver it, but more recently, um, in uh, September, uh, we began shipping um, uh, uh, spatial audio mixing, live spatial audio mixing, integrated into Ozo Live. Um, so that's the, um, that's the as, as far as I know, as of today, it's still the only, um, only product available to do that. Okay, so I think we speak about the different uh, elements, your camera, your Stitcher, your SDK. Yeah. Uh, maybe we are going to switch back to Margaret because I would like to know what was the end user perspective? Did you get feedback from your, your management first? Because mm -hmm. I heard your management was expecting a super high quality. Uh, second, the end user, what could you, could you share with us uh, in terms of end user experience? In general, the end user experience was quite positive. Um, but you're still finding that adoption rate. You know, there's a lot of new users of VR that looked at this video and kind of got it, but they were like, well, hold on, why is it so grainy? So that's something we definitely want to address on this panel on where the future will lead. Um, but as far as now TV is concerned, to them, it, it was a huge success because the all in all, um, media exposure it provided and just the experience and the evolution of VR really makes it a viable option to look at it again as the renewal for the content rights come up. So keeping it with them, showcasing that they can add elements to traditional broadcasting for user experience. So it's a win-win from the, both parties in that regards. Okay. And uh, any social media, like did you get a lot of people commenting during the match? Because I believe when people are excited, they like to share with their friends. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what did you see? Did you see more traffic about uh, the, the event on the social media? Not as much as we would have liked, but that is truly the handicap of time that we did have. As you know, the app, we didn't get it until two days prior. So it's difficult to advertise something Very you don't have. Very difficult to advertise in two days okay. to go to the app store and, and get it on your HMD. Okay. So from a project perspective, what were for you the biggest challenge? Um, so we actually broke this down in six specific challenges as we debriefed with the event. Uh, first and foremost, you have a very short period of time and the equipment had to be shipped in. So this is in Hong Kong, but the equipment wasn't readily available. So right there, you lose some valuable time in compiling it. Uh, secondly, the camera, camera positioning. This was critical for a true 360 environment and experience where on the field you can place them and also where we're not interfering with the players, with the other um, elements on that field. Third, you still have to convince Now TV that we were going to deliver something high quality. So we had to do a demo pre-event to kind of prove that case in order to um, pass on to the next. Then really the critical part in this that we learned was the app. Um, trying to get that approved, it typically has a two to three week window to get an app onto the app store, having it available on all these different platforms. That proved to be a, a huge hurdle that we only barely made. So lessons learned there. Then lessons from a provider perspective, us, is CDN. You know, we're, <coughs> excuse me, we're putting on a 25 meg bit rate, rate and not all CDNs can support that. So that's a challenge in the marketplace that still needs to get addressed. And last but not least, also viewing. So the viewer, to have the true experience, needs to have a minimum of 25 megs internet access. Luckily in Hong Kong, fiber to the home is quite commonplace, so we have that. But you couldn't just be somewhere in a bar or outside watching this with your CSL mobile de device because you might not have enough bandwidth to do so to get a true experience. So my encoder was not good enough, probably. Right. Okay, I have to work on that. <clears throat> we'll come back next year. So now, let's talk about the limitation on the user experience. So we briefly discussed about the limitation 
like we send a 4K video, but at the end of the day, yeah. the user sees only a limited size because of the field of view. So what would you recommend for next year? What would you dream to see in terms of new experience, resolution, sound? What, what, yeah, is the yeah, dream, yeah. what is the dream as a service provider? The dream as a service provider is, of course, if people hear 4K, they're expecting to see 4K, even if this device sits right in front of their eyes and we're not quite there yet. So I'd love to hear, where's Tile going? So really, Thierry, back to you, right? Okay. What can you do there? Well, I'll kick the ball to uh, Devon first. Sure, sure. Um, well, you know, I, I do feel that, I think I'm not alone in this, that w when, you, when you talk about real-world VR capture, real-world you know, 360 video capture and delivery, um, resolution remains the biggest challenge. Yep. Um, and it is a challenge at every part of the pipeline. Um, you know, as, a, as an example, um, you know, one of the reasons why um, the OZO was uh, constructed the way it was with a certain um, data rate and, uh, and actually in-camera in compression was because the, the, the data rates from those eight cameras were so high at raw resolution or at raw um, data rates that there was no recorder on Earth that could actually record them fast enough. Mm -hmm. Right? There was, there was no SSD that had a, had a write rate fast enough to keep up with the raw data from those eight cameras. So that was, you know, three years ago or so when the OZO was being designed. But it's an example of the kinds of bottlenecks that we see at every point. You know, the, 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 the production pipeline, the video production pipeline, the broadcast pipeline, the streaming pipeline, the rendering pipeline on devices, battery life, CPU power, GPU power, all those things have been scaled for standard video, for mm -hmm. HD video, and now to some degree for 4K video. That's, uh, you know, allowed us to get to 4K spherical, that is, you know, uh, 4K all the way around, um, you know, the 360. But getting past that is a big challenge because at every point in that production chain, you need to upgrade. And you need to upgrade to something that where there, there is not, uh, you're sort of in an uncharted territory. You know, obviously there is 8K television, but it's not, you know, the standards don't exist. The interchange formats are, are you know, still under, uh, you know, under debate. And really only NHK and Sony have deployed anything, and it's astronomically expensive. This stuff doesn't exist in the field. Um, and then on the client side, you have, you know, decoders on mobile devices that max out at 4K. Um, and then, of course, in between, you have the challenge of bandwidth. So how do you address those problems? Um, step by step is the answer. Um, I think we will see, well, we, are, we have already seen, um, just in the last few months, capture devices, 360 capture devices on the market that can capture at 6K or 8K. Um, these are using built-in compression chips, which compromise quality to some degree, but they get the data rate down to the point where it can be delivered. Then you run into the problem of broadcast production. You can't use those 4K switchers anymore. There's no 6K switcher that you can buy off the shelf at the mm -hmm. local store. Blackmagic doesn't make one yet, right? Um, so it becomes, you know, getting to 6K or 8K, that workflow needs to be reinvented. And then the delivery becomes an issue because you can't deliver a 50 megabit stream today or next year or the year after that or the year after that. Um, even if you could do it, it's probably not economical. Um, so how is that going to get solved? And that comes down to the, um, the uh, what's variously attributed as viewport adaptive streaming or field of view streaming or something like that. For those of you who aren't familiar with this, this is a, uh, it's analogous to adaptive bitrate streaming, except instead of having different bit rates, you send different parts of the sphere at different resolutions. There are multiple implementations for this in the, um, uh, you know, in the market now. Um, there is a um, in-process MPEG OMAF standard, uh, omnidirectional media format standard, um, which is being published, I guess, later this year. Yes, right? there was and a meeting last week yeah. in Hong Kong, Macau. Very good. Where we try to align all the stars. Yeah. It's, it's not simple. No, yeah. And, and it there seems is like also the VR industry forum, so both Nokia and Harmonic are members, yeah. where we try to bring from an end-to-end -end perspective 
a definition of all the different building blocks you mentioned from camera down to screen. Yeah. How can we put all that in a realistic commercial deployment in the next 12 to 24 months? Right. And I think you have your proposal, you yeah. want to mention open source? Well, yeah, what, the, the, what? the standards wheels are turning slowly and they will eventually converge on something that is inter interoperable. But for the moment, um, uh, there's fewer standards. Um, uh, Nokia has developed our tiled media standard, which is, has the benefit of being very simple. It requires no changes to the codec, no changes to the CDN. It's simply a, uh, a protocol for defining in the manifest how a sphere can be broken up into separate tiles that are delivered as separate streams to be assembled on the client side. Um, it has already been implemented by a couple of vendors. I know Harmonic is looking closely at it and has done some implementation on some similar schemes as well. Um, you'll, uh, there will be some announcements from Nokia in the coming weeks. I, I can't actually make one now, um, unfortunately, but uh, very soon you'll hear more from us about how uh, this standard, we, we hope to uh, enable the community to use this standard more broadly mostly as a stopgap between now and the time when you know, OMAF and the proper standards emerge from the standards bodies. This is something that's quite easy to implement. Um, the upshot is you don't deliver the full sphere at full resolution with the result being not only a lower bit rate, so with no other changes you get 40 to 50 percent bit rate savings, but there's also significant benefits on the client side. So the client doesn't have to decode the entire sphere and this allows you to uh, drive higher resolutions, 6K or even 8K monoscopic, 6K stereoscopic, on devices which only have a 4K hardware decoder because you don't actually have to decode the entire frame all at once. So the result is that you will see, I think, in 2018 already, um, the emergence of 6K, 8K uh, broadcast capable pipelines. And as a first step toward that, um, just three weeks ago, uh, we worked with uh, several partners to deploy at uh, the Oculus Connect conference the first, as far as I know, the first live public live stream that had dual 4K, so for, full 4K per eye, had uh, live mixed ambisonic audio, and had viewport adaptive streaming. So we were delivering 4K per eye at about 12 megabits a second. So twice the resolution that we had here, not even a year ago, at mm -hmm. half the bandwidth. Um, so with tiling technology. Yeah, with, tiling, with that tiling technology I just described. So that, um, those advances are on the way. Um, the bigger challenge then becomes, as I mentioned before, the broadcast production pipeline. How do you do a proper broadcast at 6K or 8K or 8K stereo? You know, those tools don't exist. So um, that becomes the next hurdle. Um, so, you know, I like to say I, I really enjoy working in this discipline, in, in VR 360, um, because there's 20 years worth of problems to solve. <laughs> Once we increase the resolution, um, we'll be moving into, you know, light field uh, capture and render and mixing and display. You know, once we get past strapping LCDs to our faces, we'll be scanning, you know, lasers on, directly onto our retinas. I mean, there is, there is so much further to go that it's quite amazing that even now in these first sort of steps, we're able to de deliver a, a pretty compelling experience to the end user, and it's only gonna get better from here. Mm -hmm. So I have a question for you, Devon. Uh, we all have read with a lot of interest the announcement of Oculus Go, which is going to provide to consumers for $200 yeah. a complete HMD with the hardware and the headset. Do you believe this could be a turning point to the adoption of VR at scale? I do with a caveat. I would say, um, you know, I think for uh, gaming experiences and for CGI experiences, the, the problem with the Oculus Go is that it's going to have a relatively low resolution screen. They didn't specify what that resolution will be, um, but it was clear that we're not gonna expect it to go beyond the current generation of, of devices. Which is 2.5K by 1.5K? Varies, Ish. give or take, but yeah, in that area, Ish. right? So um, for me, you know, a compelling experience with, you know, low polygon CGI content is, is totally feasible with that kind of hardware. 
but a compelling delivery of real world presence, like we're talking about here, mm -hmm. is not. Mm -hmm. So it will be a turning point in as much as the price point is fantastic, the ease of use will be a huge step forward. People will give it to their parents for Christmas, you know, and it will bring about a much broader you know, audience uh, of potential mm -hmm. users of VR. But I think it will have more benefit for the gaming sector mm -hmm. than it will for this you know, live <coughs> event or, or a real life capture sector. I really think for that, we need higher end headsets. We need more resolution. Um, and uh, when, and for, for that, I think we're still gonna be in this sort of world of premium content for a narrow audience that will understand what this, what the, the very high resolution experience, the high immersion experience is like. And then probably free, ad-supported, sort of um, more broad-based experiences for the folks with things like Oculus Go. Okay. Margareta, from your perspective, how do you project yourself in 12 to 24 months? If we can give you better resolution, more efficient network delivery, higher resolution device, do you believe you can reach a different audience is the web going to accelerate the VR adoption? So I, I think it falls into multiple components there. Um, so more viewers, yes, I, I would hope so. Uh, because take a look at this that you can be present at the game or you can be sitting in your living room being engaged in the game. But you can take it out of those live events as well. What if you want to watch a TV show and then the bonus session afterwards is a behind the scenes tour? So VR can fit in so many different ways in a traditional broadcasting environment that the adoption rate could be extremely high. Um, or take concerts. Instead of being physically at a concert, you can be at home kind of being part of it. It will draw in also the, the younger generation in still being engaged with the traditional television plus combining it with a VR experience as long as it really gives you that quality of immersion. So I, I completely agree. I, I think the path is, is limitless in how this and where this can be applied. And we're excited about that. Okay, so you think when people are a bit uh, bearish about VR, saying VR is a bubble, is another 3D. You have <clears throat> elements in your mind to say this is not true. No, we, we don't think it's a bubble. Um, it's going to be become a component of the whole broadcast media environment, just as much as they first said OTT may have been a bubble. Well, it surely isn't. Yep. So this is a technology layer on top of all this that just calls for an, an audience engagement. And I find just looking at the, the younger generations that it is about immersion and en engagement. So no, to me that would not be a bubble. Devon, bubble I, I, or no bubble? Yeah, I think the, the, um, the word that Margaret just used, uh, engagement, that's, mm -hmm. that's the key, that, that's what we're seeing from data, <laughs> from the use of headsets. You know, you see that you know, so there's, there's data that Samsung shared about the usage of their Gear VR, right? Mm -hmm. Among the people who got the Gear VR, and I, I don't have a slide for it, so I'll have to, rem you know, this, I'll do my best to remember that. I give the slide there, yeah. okay? You don't, uh, um, there was don't. a subset that used it a couple times and put it away. And that, but there was a subset who used it more and more, mm -hmm. you know, started using it and then increased time in headset. Similarly, Next VR reported over time from one broadcast to the next um, in their, uh, their NBA series. Yep. Mm -hmm. The average time in headset went up from game one to game two to game three to game four. Like, this is what we're seeing. We're seeing, in, and these are interrelated, right? The content creators are learning how to create for the medium, and they're creating better content. Yep. And you're seeing viewers are spending more time with that content, mm -hmm. which gives the reason to make more content. You know, the, the, the problem remains that the audience is too small for individual um, productions to necessarily pencil out on a retail basis. You know, it has to be in the context of a brand strategy, of something where there's follow-on benefits, you know, today for a company like PCCW, mm -hmm. you know, the, the individual production just, you know, you couldn't sell tickets to it and make back the cost of the production today. Mm -hmm. Now, there are probably events that you could do that. And, you know, if you had done it with the Hollyfeld fight, I bet you, you know, you could have made a million bucks. 
Um, but um, the number of events that, are, that fall into that category are relatively small just because of the size of the, uh, the addressable market, right? But as that market continues to grow, more and more of these productions will pencil out. And, um, and you'll see, again, the quality increases, the time and headset increases. I think those are the trends that are moving in the right mm -hmm. direction. The hype cycle does its thing, right? Um, but when you look at that engage, those engagement metrics, that's what gives me cause to believe that um, this, this is a medium that's here to stay. Mm -hmm. Perfect. So now it's time for questions. That means we stop talking. It's time for <laughs> question. Right. So if we have any question in the audience, so we had a lot of talk, so it's time for you to maybe ask questions on what you heard or something you have not heard of. So do we have any mic or is it just uh, no, no mic? Please, you have to speak loud because... Uh, Uh, and that, that's a really, really good point because one of the challenges as we were doing this particular event where the games are only 14 minutes each is to change it from one camera to the next. So if I look this way and then it picks up the camera, you, you tend to like move your head and no one wants to sit and watch TV or watch the HMD that way. So that's an excellent point. And they're working on that angle as well. How can we improve the quality that they have less of their actual movements they need to, the, the viewer needs to make to get that same immersion experience. Um, you probably have something to add to that with the sure. camera perspective. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I'll admit there's a, there's a bit of an act of faith here, right? I mean, I feel like the experience as it exists today um, is not the kind of thing that, you know, that most people would want to watch an entire football mm -hmm. game, you know, uh, within the headset. But, I see this as a, as a glimpse of where it will be when, you know, when the resolution is much higher, when the headsets are much lighter, and especially when there is a social element inside the headset. Mm -hmm. Whether that's as simple as you know, a 360, 360 content with AR glasses where my wife is sitting next to me on, the t my, on, on my sofa, right? Or I think much more interestingly, when my buddy from my hometown who now lives on the other side of the world he and I can together watch our team in the championship, right? I would do that today with, you know, for example, Facebook Spaces, which is a terrific social implementation. Now, I mean, there's the famous William Gibson quote, right? The future is here already. It's just not evenly distributed. Nobody has an Oculus. None of my buddies, you know, from that I grew up with has an Oculus Rift so that, that we can go, you know, watch the World Series in, in, in the Rift, right? Together, you know, talking trash with each other. But, I want that. I think I'm not the only one who wants it. And I can see that we're not far from getting there. Mm -hmm. So I would like to make maybe one comment, because I think we'll have other questions. One, one use case we have not explored yet is you are watching a classical broadcast game for two hours. And then you have uh, the replay available from your headset mm -hmm. or from the tablet. And you can, while you have the replay of the goal, for example, you can see where's the defense, who is making the fault, where's the referee, how come the referee at uh, 30 meters is able to make any statement, a judgment call. So the broadcast community has not even started yet to integrate VR to the consumer experience. And what we heard at IBC was the broadcast community, people who are broadcasting even, the content producer were telling us you produce in VR and we'll tell you on which device this will land, HMD, tablet, or consumer set-top box or TV. And they will tell us how to orchestrate the different views, but I agree with you, two hours with HMD, you need to be highly motivated to do that today. But I don't think this is the use case of VR. But we have to experiment. We all agree, mm -hmm. if we make upfront conclusion, we are idiots. We have to test, see the consumer experience. And today, with all the analytics, you know how many people watch. Uh, what do they watch? What view do they watch? Uh, can they vote? They probably will have a button one day to say this was a good clip or this was not a good mm -hmm. clip. And I'm sure Nokia can do that already today. We need to engage the audience. Yes.
So you talk about the standards. Just any sort of uh, what the monetization strategy. Okay. Is okay. So so you want to talk about the standards, or you prefer to talk about monetization? The two are, are different topics. Um, I guess I'm curious about both. Okay. Let, let's start by the standards. So today, just to give a, a, a simple overview. So today, you can take a, a 4K video out of multiple camera stitching. You send that at, let's say, you send that as a single. Um, video uh, file to a real-time encoder who is going to encode it and compress it, put that on the dash or HLS manifest, and then you can target any device being HNDs, web browsers, and PCs without any interoperability problem, let's say. It's simple. What Devon was mentioning is all the field of view techniques where you say I capture, let's say, 8K, but I only send the 4K window you are watching. And I move the tiles in the caching server according to your head move. This one is not standardized, and we hope this will increase technically by four the number of pixels you watch on your screen, since we don't give you a sub-window to upscale, but we give you the native window of your HND. And this is where we believe the industry is working on right now. Service providers are eager to increase the quality. Mm -hmm. Technology providers are interested to improve the user experience. And this is part of what we call MPEG OMAF, which is an open media application framework, which will supposedly offer all the different uh, possibility to implement from the production and, of course, uh, from the decoder point of view. And we hope there will be an interoperability framework that the VR Industry Forum is working on in 2018. Sorry, quick follow-up to that. With, for the end user, mm. that, would, that would mean that I look to my right and you basically stitch in an ad into that piece of data in the 360 VR environment. Is that kind of what you would call like a banner ad? Because you have two monitors. This, this is, I mean, there are a lot of, the, let's say, I would yeah, say the like, industry, yeah. I yeah. think the industry is, is, is split, if I may say, between 180 and 360. Yeah. I assume if you are only 180, somebody will buy the ads. Yeah. This is easy. Now, the ads, you have already stitching on the client side capability where you can put an ad in 360 map mm -hmm. over the video. No, I mean, the, the current state of the art, I think, for ad insertion, as far as what I've seen in the field, um, is, is the best that we can do at the moment or that I've seen deployed has been 360 pre-rolls so that you can actually sort of do a standard pre-roll with a 360 ad content. Um, we're not seeing a lot of that, and the reason is because this, there's just not enough eyeballs, eyeballs. for it to yes. be worth anybody's time. I mean, <laughs> quite frankly, the, the, there's two major monetization models that, I'm sort of, that I've seen so far. Um, well, I guess three major monetization models that I've seen for, for VR 360 content. You know, one is straight up technology priming the pump. And Google and Facebook and Intel and Samsung are all spending many millions of dollars on that because they believe in this medium and they're going to sell a lot of hardware around it and so they're pushing it forward, right? They're continuing to do that. They're even doubling down, right? Um, so that's, I mean, not very interesting because it's kind of artificial, right? The more interesting cases are um, we do see sponsors getting behind um, VR events. So, you know, Verizon, for example, sponsored the um, Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade last year in 360. Um, they're doing it again this year. Now, how that worked exactly, I don't know. I think NBC owns the broadcast rights and they, they got a sponsorship from Verizon in order to pay for the production and pocket some money. So NBC made some money off that sponsorship deal, right? Similarly, AT&T has been doing uh, Conan O'Brien um, at um, uh, Comic-Con for three years now in 360, multi-camera shoot, big deal. Um, and they're going back next year. Um, similarly, Procter & Gamble sponsored the 360 live broadcast of um, Dancing with the Stars a couple months ago, three months ago. Um, so you see these sort of sponsorship deals where there's a whole maybe social media PR strategy around it where it's not just sort of the, the eyeballs necessarily there's a whole sort of branding strategy around it, right? And that is continuing, apparently, continuing to pencil out. Red Bull is starting to do that with music festivals as well. Um, so that's very encouraging. A lot of that is around live. Um, and then you see 
branded productions that are coming from a lot of car manufacturers, um, you know, uh, travel companies, where they're putting money into creating these fundamentally promotional vehicles for their products. And similarly, I would say for movies and television shows, they have these, you know, sidecar productions, which fundamentally serve as promotion for the main, you know, property. Um, those are the main monetization models right now. I think, again, the audience continues to grow, maybe not at a hockey stick rate, but it's growing steadily. Over time, you will have enough eyeballs for ad support. You will have enough eyeballs for traditional subscription. I think we'll see pay-per-view very quickly. I would be surprised if we didn't see major pay-per-view events even already next year, because you know things like fight sports and stuff they already pencil out, you know. So, but you know, it, those there needs to be enough of an audience to support subscription and ad-based models um, the way we are used to for OTT. And maybe also back to the quality conversation today, when you show a demo of legacy system of VR, you go to content provider, you say, can you monetize this type of experience? They are not very excited. When we have shown uh, last year at IBC, so it was 2016, the first tiling experience on a 4K screen, we could see in the eyes of content providers some dollars because they say, this I like, compared to this I don't like. So it, it's a chicken and egg. No quality, no excitement, mm -hmm. excitement, quality, quality user. So we are right in the middle of that transition, what we call VR 1.0, whatever exists today, versus VR 2.0, whatever we're building for 2018 market. and. I can see service providers who have tested, like PCW, existing technology, who say that's good, but, and maybe Margaret, you can tell us if you think with a better quality, you can get more engagement. Absolutely, I mean, it's just like you said, the whole chicken and the egg, right? So I think if the quality improves at a very fast clip, the adoption rate will just accelerate exponentially. Um, and that's really what, what we're kind of looking at, you, you know, to kind of give this a bigger shape uh, or in the very near term, because we do see huge success cases that can be working within the uh, broadcast industry. Okay. Do we have more questions in the room? Yes. Huh. That's a crucial question, actually. Oh, that's a good one. Not even close. <laughs> About. Um, about 30 feet, about 10 meters. Yeah. It's basically by the yes, yeah. that's that's why I, that's why I like fight sports with the current. Yeah, but this is that, that's why I like fight sports for the current tier of technology because. Uh, well, when we when we put out Ozo, it was, it was sixty thousand dollars, but uh, now I think a, a six thousand dollar camera from Zcam <laughs> offers equivalent level of, of capability. What's called Zcam. Zcam. There's a, there's a few manufacturers now now that Nokia has left the hardware market. There's a few camera man manufacturers that are sort of stepping up. I think um, Samsung just released a, a camera. I haven't used it myself. I have used Zcam. I've been impressed with it. Yes. Yes. Yeah. That, that. Yes. Absolutely. The, we, yes. I think the camera distance, you could see if it's too far, it's not. Uh, that's right. No, I, and and your, your question about facial recognition, that's actually really crucial. You have to be able to read the face. And, you know, that is, I mean, that's the way I like to think about the limit of a useful production. It's like if you can see the face, then it works. And if you can't, it doesn't. Yeah. I have another yeah. question. If I'm looking at a tennis match. Yeah. I, see, I need to see the ball also after stitching. Yeah, so, so this, was, this was actually a really interesting point. You know, MLB, and sorry, we, I, we will get to your questions as well. Um, we have time. You know, we, we uh, pitched MLB on, or actually they, they reached out to us last year um, to explore the possibility of doing the World Series in VR. Hmm. And um, they wound up doing, uh, you know, they, we talked about what the cameras are capable of, what was possible, and they did um, some calculations and they realized that with a, you know, high fly ball, the ball would actually be smaller than a pixel. Yeah. Oh. And for them, they're like, not this year, guys. Yes, next year. Yeah. So uh, but you now think with the tiling technology, they, they have now done VR, but um, let's just say they were made an offer they couldn't refuse. 
Okay. Other question? It's actually quite simple. You can't physically be there. This is almost just like being there. And, and that's really the main pitch on these live events, uh, that a broadcaster or the content right in, in the live events, they know that there's only so many people that are going to fit in the stadium. So next best thing is a VR, 360 VR. So that's really what this is built upon. But here's a soccer match. Okay. Yeah, that's an important point, right? So I, I, I think you're, you're, to some degree you're comparing apples and oranges, or rather you're comparing uh, you know, an apple to an orange seed, right? The, the sports is a, is a fascinating you know, use case because if you look at a modern high-end sports production, that is the result of 100 years of experimentation, of, of untold billions of dollars and, and centuries of personal experience mm -hmm. that is creating this highly produced story for you to follow as a viewer. When we look at VR sports today, what you have is we're all figuring it out as we go, right? We, there's, no, there's, no, yeah. there's no existing, there's no standards, there's, no, there's, there's, there's nobody that, no accepted best practices. Like, you know, even thing, little things like, do you cut from one camera to another? How long can the crossfade be, right? Um, <laughs> The, the basics we're still figuring out about how to create that story. I have to believe that the sheer you know, volume of space that you have to work with, the, 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 you know, the, uh, the canvas you have to paint on as a director is so much bigger than it is with television that you must be able to do amazing things with it. But the tools are so crude right now, and we have no experience, right? Um, but I, I get a glimpse of it. I mean, I've, because we sell technology to some of the best folks in the business, I get to sit next to them sometimes and watch their productions. And this is not a sports example, but it's a, a music example. I saw um, Juan Santiam from Vantage TV, who is doing um, the um, Coachella recently. Um, I saw him do something that I never saw him do before, when instead of just switching from one camera to another, he took his, um, his audience cam, panned it 180 degrees, and um, masked it so that the audience was basically from the equator down, and then superimposed it under the stage. So our hero cam right in front of the stage was looking at the band and then looking at the audience looking at the band, right? Which is not a view you would ever get from actually being at the show. It was better than the view you would get from being at the show, right? And that is what's possible, and that's what we're just scratching the surface of, and it's gonna take better tools, more creative talent, having more time working with the discipline to get to the possibilities that are there. Okay, Devon, I have to stop you. You have a lot of passion. I just want to give you the example of the Formula One. Formula One, 10 years ago, they had this great idea to have multicam, and probably the same for NASCAR. Huge failure only a few percent of the population was basically picking the camera for, this is the absolute fan, the guy who wants to see what happens in all the pit. The, the problem is you are disturbing the others. People say, why you go to this camera, that I don't care about this camera. So here we provide, we provide an experience where you don't have to pick the different camera, you are only watching 360, not on the TV screen, but on your screen. And I think this is a new way to consume the content. You don't impact the others, this is your experience, you want two minutes, 10 minutes, two hours, you decide. But the old model of the TV, interactive TV, for all those who have been in those uh, media experience 10 or 20 years ago, it doesn't work. So we need to find a new way to write the content, but also to consume the content. I believe here we probably have something which is natural, you only, have to turn your head, you don't need to click, you don't need to find the mouse 
on your couch, which is very inconvenient. So I, I think, I, I hope you agree with me that we have a new way to write and consume the content. Mm -hmm. Yes, we have not touched the virtual reality with the 3D gaming and the phone which is going to melt in your pocket after 10 minutes. That's a separate panel. I think we should uh, <laughs> maybe spend a, a different, uh, different panel on how can we achieve this virtual reality experience on consumer device. I think we are back to the PC and that's uh, a bit uh, cumbersome. Yes? The question of resolution um, is, a, is a confusing one for VR. Um, when I, because people use it different ways, um, when I refer to 4K per eye, what I'm referring to is the horizontal resolution of the full sphere. So it's 4K around, 4K equals 360 degrees, right? Um, and I'm sending a separate sphere for each eye. Um, so consumed on a rift, um, that is not quite at the level of the level the level of resolution the rift is capable of displaying at the center of its um, of its lens. Um, the the best metric for VR um, resolution is really pixels per degree. Mm -hmm. How many pixels per degree of the 360 you get? Yeah. A 4K frame as a 360 um, you know echo rectangular projection um, delivers you about 12 12.4 I think pixels per degree. Um, the Rift, the Vive, that generation of, of high-end headsets is about 13 and a half, 14 pixels per degree. So a little better than 4K, but not 4K spherical. But when, when people hear 4K, they're thinking about a 4K television screen. A 4K television screen at uh, 20 feet, at 15 feet, is about 60 pixels per degree, which is the limit of human vision, right? Um, so the use of the term 4K to refer to the whole spherical frame causes everybody to be confused about just where we are in our development in VR, right? We're not at 60 pixels per degree. That's where we need to get to, but that's gonna take two or three or four more generations of hardware to, and delivery pipelines and processing pipelines and everything else to get us there. But it doesn't break the laws of physics. We're gonna get to human visual ac acuity before too long, you know, and, um, and then it'll be even more awesome, I guess. So <laughs> maybe my last question, last question to the panel, six degrees of freedom, is it something we are going to see anytime soon or should we focus our old fashioned three degrees of freedom? Devon. How much time you got? One minute. <laughs> One right, minute so for six I, degrees of freedom. I think, I think Facebook did a great thing by throwing the gauntlet down over what they call six degrees of freedom. I think they did a horrible thing by calling it six degrees of freedom. Um, for those of you who aren't aware, Facebook announced some cameras uh, a few months ago where they claim they will have six degrees of freedom. To my mind, really what they're talking about is a severely limited form of six degrees of freedom. Where, and again, if you don't know what this means, basically the current VR video, current 360 video, only allows you to rotate your head. So those are three degrees of, of freedom, yaw, pitch, and roll. Um, but the goal is to be able to actually move in space and have the parallax work correctly and things, you know, and see depth work correctly. Now, you can simulate that with depth capture from a single camera within a very small volume, basically within the volume of the camera and a little bit outside it by using some tricky, you know, um, deep learning based hole filling. Um, so that's what Facebook's talking about when they say six degrees of freedom. It's a very limited, it's a great thing. It's gonna be really cool. It'll make that sense of realism that much better than we have today from 360, which usually gets the parallax wrong, even when it's stereoscopic. Um, but it's not true six degrees of freedom or what, you, what we used to call free viewpoint video, where you can literally go anywhere, not just the location of the camera. You know, where you know, if, the, if the football, if the quarterback throws the football, you can actually fly with the football to the receiver, right? That also doesn't break the laws of physics, but it is way harder to do, and it'll take a much longer time. That's, that's a decade or more away from even you know, real world you know, uh, you know, distribution, even in a crude form. Um, but this initial form will be great. I just wish they hadn't called it six dot. Okay, <laughs> perfect. So I want to thank our panelists for 
first making it here, sharing their enthusiasm, and of course, you can have a conversation with them. Those interested, I also have here the Give Your Experience of the Hong Kong 7. Feel free to come and uh, talk with the panelists. Thank you very much for your attention and for your questions.